Hey YouTube, this is Alexander and today I'm finally bringing you my review of the Google Pixel XL. So the Pixel lineup of phones is Google's new creation that picks up right where the previous flagship line left off. They've scrapped the Nexus brand and have decided to create something focused more on mainstream consumers and they wanted to start with something relatively fresh. Enter Pixel. Rest in peace Nexus. So the Pixel comes in a few different configurations. We've got a smaller version with a 5 inch display named Pixel and a larger version with a 5.5 inch display named Pixel XL. They're available and 32 and 128 gigabyte storage options and available colors include very silver, quite black, and really blue. Now the really blue is only available as a 32 gigabyte option. Pricing starts at $649 for the 32 gigabyte version and jumps up an extra $120 to $769 for the Pixel XL. However, the 128 gigabyte model will tack on an extra $100 to whatever size you choose. Now if that's a little too steep for you to shell out all at once, Google is offering financing options and it is available from Verizon. However, with that said, let's talk about what you'll be getting for that price. One of the nicer things about this year's devices from Google is that the smaller version is not an inferior version spec-wise. The only differences between the two are the display size, the display resolution, and battery size. The Pixel is sporting a 5 inch 1920x1080p AMOLED display with a 2770mAh battery, while the Pixel XL comes with a 5.5 inch 2560x1440p AMOLED display and a 3450mAh battery. The Pixel has a very polarizing build. It feels very nice in hand with its smooth back, slight curvature on the front glass when swiping in from off screen, and solid construction with a sturdy feel. But many have called out its large chin, uninspired design, and awkward glass and metal back. I said it in my first impressions video and I'll say it again. The large chin really isn't that bad. Does it add some length or weight to the device? Sure. Is it useless? Well, that added length probably allows for a slightly larger battery than if it didn't have it, so I really don't mind it at all. As for the concerns regarding the awkward looking back and bland design, I actually like the two-tone backing. It's pretty unique and it eliminates the dreaded camera hump, and the design is clean and simple. I'll even admit it's iPhone-esque, but the iPhone is also a beautiful looking piece of hardware, so I don't really mind that either. This will boil down to personal preference, but honestly, I think the design and overall look is pretty nice. Holding it also feels good, especially since that metal is nice and cold every morning. Oh, and it is a little chunky as well, but it's really not too bad. The buttons are super solid and very clicky, which adds to the premium feel of the Pixel, but they do have a little wobble inside their little frame. Nothing to worry about, but it is there. The bottom features a single firing speaker, which we will get to, and our USB Type-C port. On the left side, we've only got a SIM card slot. On the back is that two-tone material glass and metal look, fingerprint sensor, and camera. The fingerprint sensor is super quick as expected, and it's even got a few software gestures, which I'll get to a little later. By the way, the glass on the back is actually easier to scratch than I thought it would be. I've been extremely careful when placing my Pixel on surfaces that may scratch it, but it's already got a few small ones. The camera may have a hard time picking them up, but in certain lighting, they're definitely noticeable. And yes, there is a headphone jack. It's not in the ideal location, but it is there. Let's talk about that camera though. Google has boldly stated that this is the highest rated camera from the folks over at DxOMark who gave it an 89, the highest of any smartphone ever rated by them. Additionally, the Pixel is packing an IMX378 sensor from Sony, which comes in at 12.3 megapixels with an f2.0 aperture for the rear camera. But what does that marketing and camera jargon mean for everyday use? Well, it means you'll be getting some pretty impressive shots for the most part. In my testing, I noticed in bright sunlight, you can get some really good shots. They look sharp, clear, and although they tend to be a little more vibrant than real life, that aspect will come down to a personal preference. Something I noticed that I really liked was the dynamic range capabilities. It does a very good job at keeping the highlights at a reasonable level and does a good job of not overexposing the shot. Indoor shots gave me a pleasant surprise since the noise was basically non-existent and the color still looked good and the picture detailed despite not being in an area with the best lighting. Moving to nighttime shots, we can see that the color begins to look a bit more subdued, the noise begins to creep in, and the shots kind of look a little more soft. However, I didn't find it all that bad. And for those of you wondering, there is a sort of obnoxious halo effect at certain positions when a bright light is nearby, but I haven't found it to be a huge issue in either my daily picture taking or testing. Flipping the camera to the front, it's an 8 megapixel camera with an f2.4 aperture, and it is an awesome camera for selfies, since it's pretty wide, which will allow you to capture more of the scene in a single shot. As for video, the stabilization is pretty intense 
insane, unlike anything I've ever seen from a phone camera before. It has this very drone-like feel to it, which may not be your cup of tea, but I really like that. Even when you're walking, there's pretty much no shake to the video. As far as quality goes, I think it looks good too. Overall, Google did an excellent job in this department despite its lack of OIS, and I think that the camera is something worth touting. Moving on down, there are two parts to the speaker. First is placement, and second is quality. Now before I get to either one of those, I do want to say that only the left grille is actually a speaker, so it gives off the impression that there are two, but there's actually only a single firing speaker. Anyway, the placement is unsurprisingly a poor choice given the large bezels that they could have taken advantage of. It's easy to cover up while gaming or watching videos, which I have done multiple times and it does get annoying. However, the quality is actually pretty good. It's able to maintain a good amount of clarity at max and it's actually got a decent amount of bass to go with it. It doesn't have that stereo speaker feel, which is a bummer, but it's actually not bad for a single speaker. However, it definitely could be better. Now let's chat about that display. So as mentioned, this model has a 1440p AMOLED display and I gotta tell you, it's my favorite display in any Google device thus far. The slightly smaller size from last year's Nexus 6P makes it a tad bit sharper and even easier to use. It's very vibrant with its colors and of course it's got those inky deep blacks. Now it's a tad on the cool side but that's really not noticeable unless you're comparing it to other devices. It just looks very nice as a display and I think everyone from the average consumer to the tech enthusiast is going to be really pleased with it. However, one of the most impressive aspects of the Pixel is software, specifically the combination of top tier hardware and finely tuned software. It's running the latest version of Android, Android 7.1 Nougat. Now I haven't mentioned the specs very much and that's because I'd rather focus on the experience regardless of what the specs are. Specs are important, but as Apple is able to demonstrate time and time again, they aren't everything. With that said though, the Pixel is hands down the smoothest device I have ever used. It's Snapdragon 821, Adreno 530, 4 gigs of RAM, and the lightweight fine tune OS have all been combined to form the best Android experience I've ever had. Transitions, animations, and gestures are all smooth in a way that Project Butter couldn't have ever even dreamed of. The small things in the software are also a reminder of the time spent on trying to make it this great experience. For example, the animation that appears from tapping on the home button, or the arrow animation when swiping up and down on the app drawer as well as the fading. However, there are other things in the software that aren't exactly everyone's favorite. The permanent search and weather widget is certainly something I've seen people voice discontent about. The biggest one though is probably the icons. So Google is really pushing for developers to change their app icons to be circles. Now I personally don't mind that, but I know that other people do. However, the nice thing about Android is that if you don't like something about it, you can probably customize it. So in this case, you can slap on your own custom launcher and an icon pack. Now speaking of icons, Google has added a new feature dubbed Quick Actions, which can be accessed by long pressing on an app icon. Now I honestly don't use these that often and sometimes even forget that they're there, but if you're looking for something similar to what the iPhone has, rest assured it's here. There are also some moves which includes fingerprint gestures, jumping to the camera, and flipping the camera. The swipe down on the fingerprint sensor to access the notification area is the only one I use and I found it super useful in those tight situations. One of the biggest features that is exclusive to the Pixel is Google Assistant. So Assistant is an expansion and improvement on their voice search function they've had since the very early days of Android. It's like Siri, but arguably better and more lifelike. You can ask it questions with the command OK Google or long pressing on the home button. Google Assistant can answer standard questions like how tall is LeBron James, which you can then follow up on with another question asking how old is he? And understanding context is one of the main highlights of Google Assistant, and it's super nice to not have to repeat everything when you want to know something that you've already mentioned before. It can also set alarms, reminders, make calls, send messages, play games, tell jokes, navigate somewhere, and a ton more. It's definitely got a more lifelike personality to it than a couple years past, and I think that really adds to the experience. It's actually pretty useful for me, and I think it's a great addition. I just hope that Google can bring this to other devices in the near future. Now, we can't forget about battery life. So while my mileage will vary from yours, I've been able to make it through a day pretty easily with my normal usage. But what does that actually mean? It means getting upwards of 14 hours on a single charge with around 5 hours of screen on time. I'm mainly using it to message, browse reddit, twitter, watch a few youtube videos here and there, listen to an hours worth of podcasts every night, and some pokemon go. I keep my brightness at around medium outside with adaptive display on and while I'm inside it's at about 25% or so. On heavy days when I'm watching a ton of youtube and constantly on reddit and twitter, like on election night and playing Pokemon Go, I can kill it in about 10 hours or so. On lighter days when I'm not using it for media consumption or playing any Pokemon Go, I'm able to make it into a second day. Overall, I'm very happy with the battery life on the Pixel XL, but remember, since your usage and number of apps installed will be different than mine, so too will your daily battery life be. 
Now let's talk about the other little things. So the Google Pixel doesn't come with an SD card slot, doesn't have IP67 water and dust resistance like the iPhone or the Galaxy S7, and yeah, it has an IP53 rating, but let's be honest, that's really nothing, especially for the price. However, on the flip side, you do get unlimited backup for full resolution photos and videos up to 4K for free and 24 seven live support if you need it. Also, Google did throw in a USB-C to USB adapter, which can be super useful if you need to transfer some files between your phone and a flash drive, which sort of makes up for the lack of an SD card slot. So at the end of the day, when all is said and done, the Google Pixel is quite a hard sell for many, and I understand that. But it's also finally a solid, smooth, premium handset that has a chance to represent Android in a light it's never been represented in before. Yes, the price tag is high, and I know some of you Nexus fans out there feel like Google has left you behind, and sure, it doesn't have any of the bells and whistles other devices have for a similar price tag, but you are getting Google's most fine-tuned device yeah, you're getting exclusive features, software updates before other devices, and an amazing software experience. However, I do hear some of your concerns, and I hope Google corrects some of the Pixel shortcomings, like the speakers and water resistance rating in its next iteration of Pixel. So if you're in the market for the best Android experience, and depending on your needs, the best experience a smartphone can bring, look no further than Google's new Pixel line. However, if you're looking for something a bit less expensive, I'll leave my OnePlus 3 and Nexus 6P reviews down below. I hope you all enjoyed the video, and stay tuned for some comparison videos and other Pixel coverage. If there's anything I missed or that you have a question about, be sure to leave a comment down below and I will catch you in the next one. Peace.